Well, hi everyone, and greetings from N, Michigan. This is Bob TSG, and today we're going to review a flat earth experiment by Dr. John D and Miss Karen B. We're going to start off with their cherry picked and creatively edited clip from Dr. N D T. Oh, by the way, you might ask yeah. if, quote unquote, nature abhors a vacuum, which of course it doesn't because most of the universe is vacuum. Mm -hmm. um, how come all Earth's atmosphere doesn't just rush out into the vacuum of space? It's true. You Why doesn't it? Yeah, because Earth has gravity, and the gravity keeps the, the atmosphere separate from the rest of the vacuum of space. That's all. Well, let's watch them misapply well-known scientific principles to show why space is scientifically impossible. Cue the music. Now here's the experiment in question. They have a vacuum chamber set up with a vacuum pump and they're going to place a beaker that has been wetted with tap water and then shaken out into that vacuum chamber. Then they're going to remove the air from the vacuum chamber. Normal atmospheric pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury. They're going to suck almost all of that out with a vacuum pump, more than 99% of it. As a result, the pressure in the chamber will become quite low, the water on the beaker will boil off and form water vapor, which will also be removed with a vacuum pump. Then they're going to go ahead and release the vacuum pump and refill the chamber with air, and you're going to see the condensation on the beaker in the inside of the vacuum chamber. Now it should be noted that the rapid condensation occurs because there is water vapor in atmospheric air that is rushing in and rapidly expanding. Now this is a chart to demonstrate the boiling point of water. We have freedom units on the left and then temperature Celsius and then inches of mercury in, in vacuum. As you can see by the time you get down to the 29.91 inches removed, which is what they did, water will boil at minus 24 degrees Fahrenheit and minus 31 Celsius. As the air in the water vapor is being removed by the vacuum pump, the air inside the chamber will be very dry, uh, essentially devoid of air molecules because of the vacuum. And then when you allow atmospheric air with its inherent water vapor to suddenly rush in and then rapidly expand to fill the entire container, it will cool and condense on the sides of the beaker and the inside of the container. This is a well-known and normal phenomenon. Well, this is a very normal and well-understood phenomenon. Uh, rather than attribute it to normal condensation due to expansion, they have a novel approach. Let's have a look. When the pump is switched on, the air pressure decreases and the liquid particles of water change to gas particles of water. The gas particles move randomly in all directions and will follow the second law of thermodynamics and immediately diffuse, or spread out, throughout the shape and volume of space defined by the material boundary of the container. Or in other words, they'll boil off in form basically a steam or a water vapor which will then be sucked out by the vacuum pump. I think it's important to go over some of the gas laws here and describe how they are used in practical everyday use. A good example of uh, using the gas law is your refrigerator. What happens in a refrigerator is that warm objects are placed in the refrigerator and they transfer their heat to coolant. That coolant is then pumped under pressure to a radiator system in the back of the refrigerator. Those radiators become warm. That heat is transferred off into the room. And then the compressed gas is run through a very narrow hole and rapidly expanded to allow it to cool and form cold that can receive more heat from objects in the refrigerator. This demonstrates very clearly what happens when gas at one atmosphere pressure 
is suddenly introduced into a vacuum chamber, it rapidly expands, cools, and the water vapor in that chamber condenses. I think it's very important to point out that the water vapor from the water that was originally on the inside of the beaker was sucked out with the air from that vacuum chamber. The air from the kitchen that is rushing back into the vacuum chamber has water vapor in it as well and that is what is condensing on the beaker and on the inside of the vacuum chamber. Now an example of this occurring without a container and in nature is that when air containing water vapor expands due to a decrease in temperature and cools to the dew point, we get these guys. Notice that the base of these clouds is at a set level. That level has a set pressure and a set temperature and that is when the clouds begin to form. Now another question that you may have is why do some clouds lay flat and others heap up? That will become important a little bit later. And although gravity really has nothing to do with this, this water vapor is already present in the air throughout the uh, air column. It just condenses at a certain temperature and pressure forming clouds. Let's see how they try and relate gravity to this experiment. Remember, the downward force on the water droplets, termed by consensus as gravity, could not overcome the attractive forces between the water droplets and the side of the glass, which resulted in the water droplets remaining stationary. Both the combined strength of the attractive forces between the water droplets and the side of the glass and the downward force cannot prevent the water gas particles from leaving the open container when a decreased air pressure is produced. So let's go over another kind of important principle here. When water goes from liquid water to a gas, it goes to a higher state of disorder or entropy. It diffuses out into the environment. As you can see, that actually generates a pressure, and that's how a tea kettle whistle works. You also may notice that that hot steam tends to rise until it cools enough that it layers. Now another thing you may wish to consider is what would happen if you place some cool glass in that water vapor. Would you see condensation? The average atmospheric pressure at sea level is 1013.25 mbar. The pressure in interstellar space is approximately 0.000000000000000000 mbar. Space is 0.0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
The water in the chamber was under approximately 50,000 times less air pressure, 0.02 mbar, compared to when under normal atmospheric pressure, 1013.25 mbar. And you saw that the force of gravity cannot prevent the loss of water from the beaker. You see, I wasn't kidding. They're comparing sea level to the vacuum of space and gravity to boiling. Remember, the surface of the ocean and clouds are not in contact with space. Applying the same scientific principle here, no matter how uncomfortable, we know what must happen to the Earth's atmosphere and liquid water. Low pressure region, such as space, existed next to our atmosphere, clouds would not be possible. The seas, oceans, rivers, lakes, and other water bodies would also not exist. We would not exist. Please check out the experiment for yourself. Do not take my word for it. First, go to your local school. The science department will have a vacuum chamber and pump. Two, buy one, see below, or look for a good deal on eBay, etc. Or three, contact the Action Lab on YouTube. They use their vacuum chamber to do many interesting observations. You know, personally, my vote is to go to the high school science class where they have a vacuum chamber. Now, there's two reasons for this. First of all, there will be a high school science teacher attached to that vacuum chamber and high school students standing around the vacuum chamber that can explain these principles properly to you, unlike the nonsense that you are getting in this video. I know. There is nothing I can say. In my imagination, it was full of such potential and promise. Its existence is not supported by the scientific method and the known laws of science. Where does that leave us? Looks like there are a couple of options available. 1. Become a science denier and state that the second law of thermodynamics is incorrect, even though you cannot prove it is incorrect using the scientific method. Two, smile awkwardly, ignore this evidence, and keep on believing in an ever-expanding universe, but don't think what it could possibly be expanding into. Three, do the test for yourself and start a wondrous journey of self-learning and understanding. Four, start asking difficult questions and be prepared for some difficult answers, or no answers whatsoever, and just more difficult questions. You know, up until now, I don't think they've even mentioned the second law of thermodynamics. But let's play the actual clip from Dr. Tyson. I think you'll find that they selectively edited out some important information. Let's have a look. Yeah, so a vacuum on Earth, mm -hmm. we think of nature pouring it because air wants to get inside the vacuum. Yeah. Air wants okay. to go into the vacuum. Air wants to go in because you are in a place where there's air pressure that wants to get inside. As you get higher up in the atmosphere, the air pressure gets less and less and less and less and less. Because there's less air above it pressing down. And when you get less and less and less and less and less, the air doesn't want to do anything. It's got no forces. There's no air pressure to make it work. It's just going to float away. Okay, so our atmosphere goes out thousands of miles getting ever so thinner as it gets out there. And so it's, it's not that... Earth is holding the atmosphere down, although it is, it's that the air pressure out there has no urge to go anywhere other than just staying right where it is. Now, as you recall earlier, I said that the bases of clouds form at a certain elevation, but the tops are a different story. Clouds are formed when the sun heats areas of the ground, causing hot spots. This warms the air over them, and this warm, moist air rises. When it reaches a certain altitude, and temperature, the water vapor in that air condenses. That's why cloud bases are the same. That warm, moist air continues to rise, bleeding off energy as it goes until it reaches its maximum altitude where it has devoided itself of energy. And that is where the cloud tops form. As you can see by these billowing cloud tops, they seem to be petering out at a certain altitude and starting to fall back. This is the second law of thermodynamics in motion, right in front of your eyes. The energy of that air, as it comes up, bleeds off until it's gone. 
And the same thing happens in the atmosphere. It rises to a certain height, and by the time it gets up around 100 kilometers, it's bled off all of its energy. Because there's less air above it pressing down. And when you get less and less and less and less and less, the air doesn't want to do anything. It's got no forces. There's no air pressure to make it what It's just going to float away. Okay, so basically we have a situation like this one here. We have the upper atmosphere, which is the curved line, full of air molecules that have no energy left in them. They are just sitting right there. Now, we have to look at the things that are pushing them off into space, and that is centrifugal force due to the rotation of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, opposing this is the force of gravity pulling them back towards the center of the Earth. Now, if you go back to my video, Flat Earth Can't Science, number 18, tying up loose ends, I actually do all of these equations. But in order for the centrifugal force, or excuse me, centrifugal force, to pull those molecules off the spinning atmosphere into space, we have to rotate once every 84 minutes. That is the rotational speed of the Earth required to reach escape velocity, which is 17,500 miles an hour. So to summarize this, we have uh, air molecules in the upper atmosphere, say 100 kilometers up, that have no energy left. Gas pressure pushes into a vacuum. A vacuum doesn't suck air. So if there is no pressure behind the gas, there is nothing to push it into the vacuum. The only force pushing it towards space will be the centrifugal force, and that is opposed by gravity. To look at this from a second law of thermodynamics aspect even further, in order for, an, uh, for mass to move from one state to another, there has to be an increase in entropy. The gas at the upper reaches of our atmosphere is already at maximum entropy and there's nothing driving it further into a higher state of entropy. While there could be considered a slight gradient at that level, that is easily opposed by gravity. To see this in action elsewhere in the universe, here's the planet Jupiter. It is a spherical rotating planet with an atmosphere, as you can clearly see by the swirling clouds, that has an atmosphere next to the void of space. Again, the second law of thermodynamics works the same here, just as it does on Earth. This video is dedicated to Nathan Oakley and the Flat Earth Debate. I cringe when trying to remember how many times Nathan has had to repeatedly explain the concept behind this observation. And I second that dedication. Now perhaps he'll start explaining it correctly. This rabbit hole's too deep for me. Feel my brain getting real sore.